Hi everyone, Lisa here with IVF Manifesting a Miracle, and I'm really excited to have a soul sister conversation with my friend Carrie today. Carrie Tipper is here in Colorado, and she is one of our state representatives. So I'm excited and honored to have you on, Carrie. <laughs> oh, thanks for having me, Lisa. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, you and I connected um, here during, uh, gosh, was it a year ago? I don't even remember when. Yeah. Um, you've been really involved in helping our state in passing uh, the Colorado Family Building Act, which allows families to have some fertility coverage and fertility preservation. You've been very involved in um, passing that. And I just want to thank you from my heart and from other fertility sisters here in Colorado who are really excited to um, be able to find the benefits of that, of that law, which will be next year, correct? 20, uh, I mean, 2022? So it goes into effect 2022. Yeah, no, it was, I have to say, um, one of the most rewarding things I've done in my life and not that, that old, but um, in, yeah. in terms of the work that we did to get that done and just the really sort of grassroots energy and the stories that people told to really change hearts and minds at the Capitol and, and get people to understand mm -hmm. an issue for most of us is, is really pretty private. Um, I think we asked a lot of people to come and sort of bear their heart and souls, but that's what moved the ball on this issue. And um, to this day, I get emails it's one of the only pieces of legislation that I've run where I get emails or phone calls every couple of weeks from someone saying, thank you so much for running this legislation. It's going to be a big impact. And, and so, yeah, really proud that we were able to pass legislation. Lisa, you were a big part of it too. Oh, um, thank you. And uh, a lot of, uh, as we say, warriors in Colorado and, and just, um, you know, for me, it was particularly special because as you now know, I was, I was pregnant the whole time. So I, I kind of felt like baby girl was along for the whole ride, which was really great. Yeah, deeply. It's a deeply personal matter to you. Um, you know, I think in the beginning, I mean, can you share a little bit about your fertility story? I mean, not everyone knows, you know, you yeah. two have gone through fertility struggles and how timely passing this legislation was with what you were going through. Yeah, you know, we, so as I mentioned, I actually, uh, we did an IVF transfer in early January and this bill was introduced in January. So I was actually pregnant the entire time and worked with one of my doctors who came and testified uh, on the bill and it, and it was just this really like, you know, if you have to go through something like this, the silver lining was being able to help other people. And I know, you know, you feel like that too in the work that you've done. And I think yeah. a lot of us through this um, kind of want to give back in that way and and yeah so for for me and and my husband we fell into that unexplained category um, I would say 2015 was when we um, really wanted to start um, trying to have a family mm -hmm. and didn't stress out too much about it I would have been in my early 30s at that point so 31 ish okay you know, we, we didn't think too much, um, yeah. as I think people, I mean, you spend most of your, I think, adult life trying not, to, not get to get pregnant. And then when you want to get pregnant, right. <laughs> it's like, right. So people can empathize with that. Um, and long story short, it, it never happened for, for us. And, um, you know, I, in a way that I know of, I, I never got pregnant and, mm -hmm. and so we, you know, luckily have, lucky or unlucky, have friends that have been pretty open about their experiences. So I wasn't completely in the dark and I had some awareness, which I think for me was a big blessing. Mm -hmm. I don't were know if led, it was. So. Yeah. Well, were you led right away to a reproductive endocrinologist or were you kind of with your OB for a while or? I pretty much right away. I mean, my, I had my OB expressed concern that I hadn't gotten pregnant. Um, and I was talking with friends who had been at um, a fertility clinic and, um, you know, really suggested just start right away. Um, at the very least, do some screening and some tests. Um, yeah. And so that's, I'm glad that we, we me, went right away. Too. Same with us. Because, <laughs> you know, time, time matters in these things. And I think, 
it's expensive and what as you go down the road you realize a lot of times places want to redo the test that you did at the OB's office so we started off pretty early um, with the specialist which I'm grateful that we have that advice to that's good and then did you um have any other rounds before your first round no so what happened with us or what happened with me is um in let's see i think i went to i started at can i say the fertility clinic sure, that I was at? sure. Yeah. it's open <laughs> yeah i started at ccrm i think it was in the fall of 2016 um maybe going into 2017 and what was also happening which i think a lot of us can empathize with is there was stuff going on in my personal life my dad was dying mm -hmm. and so trying to balance like is this just not going to work because we don't know why or is it the stress you know emotional stress that i feel that you know my family feels and um what we did realize was i had polyps and in, in my uterus and the specialist was the first one that caught that mm -hmm. and so did a, a surgery to get rid of them. And then it was like this optimism that, okay, now that there's no longer like this hostile environment for an embryo to attach, maybe I'll get pregnant. And I just, I didn't. And that continued through 2017. My, my dad, like I said, died early in that year. And then we really started getting serious. Okay, do we want to move forward with um, IVF and mm -hmm. I wasn't sure honestly initially that I did um, yeah and I think maybe part of me thought you know once the grief passes or you get to a good point we'll be in a better position maybe it'll happen naturally mm -hmm. and then for me as I got older I, I really was starting to get nervous that my window would disappear entirely to have mm -hmm. biological children and and that was, you know, if, if that's the way that it would have ended, I think we would have looked for an alternative and we would have been fine. Yeah. Um, but um, we, what, I also then ran for office. <laughs> you were running right at the same time, going through all yeah. that? Oh my goodness. Not stressful so, at all, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, obviously they're related. Um, so I ran for office in 2018. Um, and all those things were kind of happening at the same time, um, was elected. And then 2019, when I got sworn in was when we first started fertility treatment. Oh my gosh. So we did wow. the IUIs January, February, and March. And that was kind of the first time where I was like, this is too much for me emotionally. It's so disappointing it's you know the hormones um yeah. your hormones synthetic hormones oh, yeah. um all that emotional roller coaster really caught up with me um and you know i was you know i think for us my you know blake was as supportive as he could be but it's your body you're the one kind of hyper vigilant of everything that's happening um, and I don't know if that's how it was for you guys, but it certainly tests your partnership, your marriage. And oh, completely, completely. I didn't go through all, we have very similar stories and um, I had polyps as well. And my mom was dying as I was going through fertility treatments as well. And she got a year with our daughter, but wow. I didn't realize how parallel a lot of what we were going through was, um, you know, similar stories. Um, I did not have any IUIs or anything before IVF. So the emotional roller coaster, yes. <laughs> I know it through IVF and all the setbacks that happen. And um, after your th three rounds of IUI, did they transfer you right, move, transfer, move you right into IVF? <laughs> yeah, it was, that was, we hadn't decided whether we wanted to move forward with that. And so mm -hmm. we talked just loosely about adoption and, okay. uh, I talked to what I kind of realized um, was one, it was just taking a big toll on me physically and emotionally. And so I needed a timeout. Mm. And we were in the position, like I said, it was unexplained. Like my husband's sperm count was off the charts. I mean, um, my egg count for my age was off the charts or, or good, let me put it that way. And yeah. so, you know, there was that positive news, but then it was also like, well, then why isn't it working? Yeah. Um, and I, I kind of got this feeling that 
is this, the more times we do this, the less likelihood there is a success. And I, it, 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 and essentially it was, I was thinking of, I'm a lawyer, so I was thinking of the bar exam. So the more times you take the test, like the passage rate goes down precipitously. Oh. <laughs> and the, the physician was like, well, not necessarily, but if there's an issue with conception, IUI isn't gonna overcome that. But you guys are excellent candidates for IVF. And here's the great information. news, right? Isn't that just the news yeah. you want? Like there's a possibility and this is, yeah. And so I think, I don't know, I don't know what it was. I, I felt some, I definitely felt despair and disappointment, but I, in my heart of hearts, I think I always believed that IVF would work for us. Um, I don't know why that is. And that's a key place to start that you believe and that trust is everything in this. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's a safety or, or like a survival mechanism because um, I certainly could have, you know, they couldn't have worked. Um, but I think I tried to really keep as positive of a headspace as I could. My husband was really good about like kind of fostering that environment and making sure that I wasn't taking too much on. And, and yeah. so that's good. Uh, a supportive partner means a lot through this ride. <laughs> Especially when they're kind of spectators, you know, and they mm -hmm. are have some awareness, but um, right. not really. <laughs> <laughs> so one round of IVF, is that what you've experienced then? So we did one retrieval in uh, September of last year, and it was really successful. Great. Um, and so we had a lot to be grateful for there. Yeah. Yeah. And then and um, the only hiccup was we initially the, in, the plan was to do a, a transfer, a frozen embryo transfer in November. And right up until the day before, that's what was going to happen. But um, I'm, I messed up the medications the last, the, the day before the transfer. Which can happen. I've heard that from other people as well. But oh my gosh, how heartbreaking, right? It was. It was difficult um my doctor was amazing and she's like these embryos are just so precious it's not worth the risk totally. and in the end i think it ended up being best case for us because um we couldn't move forward with the transfer and we had a trip planned to hawaii and my husband said let's just go and relax yeah. for a week so we really i think had an opportunity to rest kind of reconnect mm -hmm. get a good headspace physical you know, space. And, um, we did the transfer instead in January. Okay. It also gave on from November to January. Yeah. And so what I really wanted to be honest, I had a hard time with all the drugs. I didn't mind the injections. They, they of course suck, yeah. but I didn't feel like myself. You gain weight. You just, you know, there's, I've been pretty physically healthy, so I've never had to medicate. And so that, that was something that just messed with my head. And I just, I really disliked that. And so the nurse said to me, you know, why don't we give you a break? Just go off of everything. And I kind of thought, I think I need that. Yeah. So, and, it, and don't you find like some of those setbacks are blessings in disguise. I really believe like those pop up on our path and we can embrace them or, you know, fight them. But honestly, like they kind of happen for a reason. And we too had a setback. Well, I had a lot of setbacks <laughs> with <laughs> scar tissue from the polyps, had to have that taken out after that surgery. And then I had a canceled transfer too. Um, they found blood in my uterus and we don't really know why, but honestly that from that point, they discovered I had fibroids that were in my uterine lining that had formed, had fibroid surgery. I mean, our doc, my original doctor left the practice, like all these setbacks. And I'm just like, got, it kept moving me forward. And, um, yeah, we are, we had our one embryo frozen. That was our only one. And she held on for us. So that's where the baby comes from, you know, we're holding on, holding on for our babies and holding on for ourselves. Like, like you were saying, you know, just reconnecting to yourself, how important that is to like stay connected on this journey. Cause you get thrown around quite a bit. Don't you think? <laughs> that's and I think if there's anything that I've learned, and this was, and I don't know if this happened with your mom too, but, you know, as my dad's health deteriorated and we were navigating the healthcare system and being his advocate, it's exhausting to do that. And it's yeah. really hard for both the patient and the advocate. 
but that's important too in your fertility journey. It's also yeah. important to have confidence in how you feel about something. So if something doesn't sit right with you, it doesn't feel right. Yeah. Honoring that gut feeling because one, right. this means a lot emotionally and physically. Two, it's expensive. Um, three, time matters. And so I, like you said, you know, having a supportive partner and, and Blake really was that those moments where we were kind of forced to take a step back mm -hmm. that just being really healthy for us for right. you know, what ultimately was successful transfer and then talking about timing so um I, we we scheduled the transfer was like i said towards the end of january and my doctor called me on february 1st to tell me i was pregnant which was the day that my dad died and i remember thinking how grateful I was to have this like wonderful memory associated with what was otherwise like this horrible day. Oh my gosh. So, we wouldn't have had that. <laughs> yeah. That's and I was like, gosh, maybe well. he does know, you know? That's a, that's you know? a blessing. That, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I always, yeah. These conversations. Yeah. When we open up. Yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, what a gift, you know? Yeah. It, it's, and like, like I said, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change a thing because I know that my fertility path has been for the most part, like pretty seamless compared to most people. Yeah. I mean, um, like to do one retrieval and one transfer and it work. Yeah. Um, I have plenty of friends that that's not the case for, um, when you fill out your intake paperwork, you realize that because it says how many transfer or how many transfers have you had and it's yeah. like, how many cycles. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you realize, wow. Um, and then just to know that what, what manifested, what came from this was legislation that actually yeah. will change people's lives is totally worth it for me. Totally. And how did you even kind of get involved in who approached you first in that space? Like to. So ironically, when I was talking to my doctor about um, moving forward with um, egg retrieval, so moving forward with IVF, uh -huh. she knew and the, the office knew that I was in um, the legislature. Funny enough, one of my constituents <laughs> works, worked at the office. Oh, and she got one of my pieces of mail. <laughs> so she brought it into the office and was like, I think this is a patient of ours. Oh. Um, so I kind of connected us and I mentioned to my doctor, I said, you know, I am interested in running legislation that would require insurance to cover infertility, um, you know, diagnoses, treatment, and preservation. And she's like, we have this monthly call that we're on and we're supportive of that effort. And we've been working with these other organizations that are trying to do that too. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got connected um, to fertility advocates and mm -hmm. Resolve and some of the other, um, you know, big players that made the bill possible. And then inviting Leslie Harrod on, how did that happen? Did you reach out to her? Or so yeah, so Rep Herod was my co-prime uh, sponsor, and uh, she and I had talked about this legislation last year. Um, so in 2018, she'd had a constituent reach out to her about it, oh. and she knew that we were going through infertility, and so she was asking. And so when the opportunity came up, I thought, you know, one, a woman of color, um, two, a constituent has reached out to her and then three she's lgbtq and the bill helps um parents of all shapes and sizes let me put it that way so uh, i thought that was important um for us to work on the bill together yeah well i, I know there's so many other states like colorado is the 18th state right now to pass legislation in the fertility space um, mm -hmm. um and Fairness, like those 18 states all look very different. Um, some, it's really nominal. It's a, um, a, a floor, really. Like they have to, you know, they have to offer it, but they don't have to pay for it. Um, oh, but Colorado is really comprehensive. I think uh, we can be really proud of what we did and especially that we did it in one session. And by the way, 
in a session that got cut prematurely short by COVID. Oh we, it, it passed got, like last day. The last day. Oh my gosh. Wow. Well, being there for those testimonials, like it was such a proud moment to just be there and hear all everyone's stories and, you know, thank you for all of your work on passing this, helping us move this forward. Pretty exciting. Um, I just want to hear any reflections with the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Like how has that, (laughs) you're my first interview of my soul sister since her passing on Friday. And like, I've really been, so I, I'm just searching to learn more about her since her passing. And I didn't realize really the impact that she's paved the way for so many women like us and you being in legislation and what has yeah. it meant to you, you know, being a lawyer? Yeah. I mean, particularly as a lawyer, a uh, <laughs> woman, I mean, you, you in law school, you read her opinions and um, it's, it's incredibly moving. And then when you know her personal story uh, and if folks haven't seen the documentary or the um Film, I forgot what it's called, that's based on the Notorious like, BG one. <laughs> Is it that, that one? one? Other one, I forgot what it's called. Um, okay. Oh, shoot. I should, it's, okay. but it, it, it goes into like a little bit of her personal life. I mean, so Justice Ginsburg was at the ACLU for a long time before she was appointed to the federal bench. And then from the federal um, circuit court in DC, she was then appointed by Clinton to the US Supreme Court. The genius in her, I mean, she's just a brilliant legal mind, super persistent. What she did is she looked at the legal landscape and said, one, we have a legal system that treats men and equal di- or men and women differently. And mm-hmm. it's completely un- unequal and illogical, but it is a male run legal system. And so the way that I can start sort of unraveling this is by bringing cases with male plaintiffs. Mm -hmm. So what she did was she kind of flipped it on its head is she built case law with male plaintiffs. So cases where men were discriminated against based on their gender that were successful. And it laid this foundation for all of these other cases that she, that were really the target, the goal that she wanted to bring. And so responsible for, I mean, transforming the legal landscape in terms of gender equality. Um, so uh, losing a, a sort of titan or a giant like her, you know, all yeah. what, 90 pounds of her oh my gosh, yeah. is, uh, is devastating. And she's irreplaceable, um, incredibly inspirational. I think what is special to me is to see how many young women that aren't lawyers or aren't interested in law or how many girls know who she is. Um, that is, uh, really heartwarming and redeeming. And, um, you know, she, um, though when I, when I found out I had been on a call all day, I was on in a committee hearing, remote committee hearing, and I got off the phone or off the Zoom and I saw these text messages. And you know, I'm like 37 and a half, 38 weeks pregnant. And I start sobbing. And my husband's like, what's wrong? And I said, Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. And he was kind of like, are you okay? Like, I understand this is meaningful to you, but why are you sobbing? I'm also and- hormonal, honey. And I'm, yeah. And, <laughs> but how, how, yeah. What an impact you had on your life. What it was, is it also kind of broke my heart to hear her, you know, worrying about the vacancy on her deathbed, you know, to think oh, about like, oh, yeah. woman dying and who's saying her wish would be that she not be replaced until a new president is installed. And so thinking about, yeah. you know, even her last moments, she's Honoring. thinking about her legacy and, and what's, what's left. So, so I had a, a very good cry. And then I thought, you know, she was not a woman... I don't think to sit and sort of wallow. She like kind of put her head down and got the work done and figured it out. And so that's inspiring to me um, to just persevere. Yeah. It's like, it's on our shoulders now to like carry on her. Yeah. Like, her, you know, her fight, her power. Was it rest in power? I like that. People have been yeah. talking about that, you know, just. And it's also, you know, her personal story um, and her relationship with her late husband was this beautiful marriage, 50 some years, 
um, of equals and there's something to be learned from the way that they treated each other too as partners and um, yeah. just a beautiful person and yeah fierce and also what I liked about her and what you see in, in reading a little bit about her life is you know she was atypical she was she was sort of slight in stature and kind of soft obviously soft-spoken yeah. and um, was not, um, people thought, the best at oral argument. And here she was still able to um, just build case by case, like brick by brick, a foundation of what ultimately ended up being um, yeah. transformed the uh, equal rights under the law for men and women. Yeah, and funny too, very funny. She just had such an elegance about her and grace and just totally. the way she carried herself. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your thoughts about her. Um, and gosh, I, just thinking, you know, my daughter too, like she, sh she just turned three right after that, the passing of, you know, Ruth. And then I'm reflecting as, as a mom with a young girl and like you're having a little girl and how, what are you excited about in bringing your daughter into the world and like just the kind of like role model you want to be for her. And, you know, I mean, I admire so many qualities about you, Carrie, like you're just a powerhouse, you know, and like, have you thought about just what, what's exciting you as you. Interesting. When I was like sitting on the stairs crying, I was like, can we give her the middle name Ruth? Oh. So I was like, sure. We can think about it. Oh. <laughs> I thought, man, I can't believe, you know, my little girl will be born not knowing not who, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was. And then I thought, well, of course, like you, you teach them and you talk to them yeah. about it. Yeah. I, you know, part of me is a little nervous. Um, I think there are things that you worry about with girls that you don't necessarily have to think about so much with boys, um, or maybe are more pronounced, uh, body image issues, mm -hmm. uh, especially with social media. Although I think those are now really proliferating across genders equally. Um, so uh, one, one of the things I'm most excited about, honestly, is kind of watching my husband grow into being, uh, you know, a father, uh, because I see like the kind of partner he's been to me, and, wow. and it's always easy being married to a politician and a lawyer and someone who's yeah. out driven, you know, he has not just handled that well, but I think admires that about me, and so... Yeah excited to see how that manifests with, with our girl. Um, I've tried really hard, like not to have like super gendered stuff. Yeah. But yeah. it's all so cute. <laughs> I know it is. You do become more aware when you go down the shopping aisles. Like I'm very aware when I see the girl toys and the boy toy, like my daughter's gotten really into cars and stuff. And I'm like all for it, you know, like not all about the Barbie stuff, not about, it's just, and then the pinks and the purples is, and the princess. Yeah. Like, Oh, yeah mix it up like i think it's it's more it's it's easier in that respect to have a girl like it's it's sort of more socially acceptable for girls to push limits and like you know yeah run like a girl is a compliment and yeah. playing cars is good and being interested in science i i think it, it it's probably more difficult the other way if you have a boy mm -hmm. that you know has is interested in the pink and purple ruffles and playing with dolls i think that that is like a harder um, uh, mm. gender norm for people to, to yeah. break. So, so in that yeah. sense, um, but I, I, I think about how do I teach her to be confident, um, and not, mm -hmm. not arrogant, confident, yeah. independent, um, yeah. you know, secure in, in herself? How do I give her the tools that she needs to be a good person, um, to help others? Um, so when and I, a story to share, sorry to interrupt you. I was just thinking like what we've gone through with our fertility journeys, you know, like the perseverance it takes and like, what, what are some of the like gifts that in your fertility journey has taught you? Or is there anything like, I mean, I think, that, yeah, you can teach your daughter. One thing is, and ironically, my, my dad was, was like this, I and mean, he really thought outside the box all the time. And um, 
for me, one of the things I learned was sort of how our body works as a whole, I think, and, and like everything from, like I said, the mental space, to the, you know, how you feel physically to emotionally. And then all the external factors, whether it was my dad or the campaign or whatever. And you know that that's true on a certain level, but I think fertility really kind of hammers that point. And so to be open to caring for yourself in, in other ways, exactly. uh, rather than just like sort of medicating. Oh yeah. Uh, and really valuing that time um, with myself, with my husband. Um, and I mean, things like acupuncture, which I had never done before. And yeah. I'm not naps, even in pregnancy, I've rarely napped. And I'd go in for acupuncture and would like fall asleep instantly. Yeah. And I thought- Realizing that rest is very productive. Rest is essential, yeah. you know, yeah. self-care. Yeah, yeah, so I, being able to create that space and prioritizing it, um, which is obvious, it's a luxury for most people. Mm -hmm. um, but part of that is, I think, identifying um, when you need to mm -hmm. hit pause um, yeah. before it gets to a critical point. So, completely. Wow. Yeah, you and I totally agree on that. It's just a holistic approach. You know, that's that's what I strive to share with others as well. You know, it infertility affects all aspects of our life, and physically, emotionally, cognitively, spiritually. I mean, it just really is a whole a whole picture to work you know with when you go through this and so yeah I, I believe that too like it's essential to take care of ourselves like number one going through this um and going back to what I said earlier too having the confidence to know what works best for you yeah um, what that self-care looks like for you for you is different than for me and I think part of what can get tricky about infertility is this feeling of like, well, if I eat this or don't eat this and I exercise this much or don't exercise this much, I'll increase my fertility odds. And I read this book that said, if you drink this much caffeine, like you'll never get pregnant. And so it, you can run down that world oh, and crazy. Okay. And so it's, you have to just kind of shut all that off. I think for me, mm -hmm. it's just like find what space works for you. And be confident that at my 36 years of life, like I graduated high school and college and law school and took the bar exam and have been in really stressful situations and won yeah. a campaign and have and already having a baby in a pandemic. <laughs> I, I'm capable. I know what works for my body and I'm capable of making those decisions. And so being confident to do that. Yeah. Everything you're saying, I totally wholeheartedly agree with like self-awareness is so important as you're going through this path. Um, well, I'm so excited for you and your soon to be baby girl in less than three weeks. Yeah. So I can't wait to, uh, you know, just see, see your little girl in your arms and hopefully I can visit you in person at some point. <laughs> um, uh, and I would say it's, it's funny being on the other side of this now because, you know, I know that of course you're happy for friends and family when they tell you you're pregnant, but it also just like takes a little bit out of you. It just, it's like a little piece of you just dies. Mm -hmm. um, and the one thing, and I don't know if this was your experience, but again, I had every confidence once I was pregnant um, that things would be okay. And part, again, part of that survival and just trying to stay in a good positive space. Yeah. Um, and now, you know, here we are less than three weeks away from this baby's arrival. And even though she's not cooperating, she's breech um, and she's <laughs> for a while, um, you know, she's healthy. I'm healthy. Um, I like tend to forget. I, I think I have sort of forgotten what it feels like to be in that, in like the, for, the infertility space. Yeah. So for better, or for worse, um, you know, I, I still want to sort of honor yeah. what it feels like to be on the other end of that, but also kind of give people hope that, yeah. you know, I was, someone was asking me the other day about the protocol and I couldn't even remember it. And I thought, I know. That's, that's crazy because it took up my whole life, you know? Uh, any so advice you'd give to like a woman listening who's like in the throes of just this kind of painful time and waiting? Any, any little last minute thoughts you could share? I think for me, I just accepted there was not a whole lot I could control. And the things that I could control were, again, going back to sort of my 
headspace and my well-being and the things that I needed to sort of relax myself. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but that knowing that I hadn't done anything wrong, you know, exactly. my wrong. Um, and yeah, yeah that's, that's really good. Good advice just to focus on the things you can control. And that's, I believe in that, you know, we, we can control a lot more than we realize with and letting go of the things that we can't, you know? And I remember when my dad died, my, my boss at the time said, like, give yourself grace. And I was like, what does that mean? And then I realized there were days where I'd be at work and I would read one sentence 10 times and I couldn't understand it. Mm. I just needed to go home. And I remember that's, that's what she means is she means give yourself that grace to say, I can't do this today and I'm going to go home. Um, and sort of like forgive yourself in those like ugly moments that you have, which I had lots of them. Um, I mean, I remember sitting in the parking lot in Steamboat Springs. We had met a group of friends for a ski weekend and two of the couples up there um, told us they were pregnant. And I like immediately started like guzzling my glass of wine. And then we got to the car and I could not stop crying. Yeah. And my husband was, you know, he was upset, like, cause seeing my reaction. Mm -hmm. But that was one of those ugly moments where I was upset because even though one of them had been through uh, fertility and it was an IVF baby, the other hadn't. And it was just, it's this ugly feeling of like jealousy and like, why yeah. can't it be? Which like, you never want to be. I know. Uh, but I, I think in retrospect, like I kind of needed that moment too to get all that off my chest, and then it was done. And so, so yeah. grace, like no, I, I, I encourage others too to let out their emotion. It's healthy and it's it's needed. It's essential to process and let it out. Yeah. You can't hold it all in. And so honoring those feelings is so important. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're wonderful. Thank you so, so much. much for <laughs> <laughs> well, so happy for you. And yeah. thank you for all you do for our state and for being an advocate. And I'm sure you'll continue being an advocate in this community. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And for anyone who's interested in personalized coaching support, um, you can find me at IVFmanifestingamiracle.com and my book, Hold On Babies, on Amazon. So it's a soulful guide to help you ride the ups and downs of infertility and IVF. We both know it very well. <laughs> so hang in there, ladies and, and gentlemen. All right. Yeah. Take care. Thanks, Carrie. Thanks.